Hello, everybody. Good morning and welcome to our online academy here with the Aquarium of the Pacific. My name is Erin and I'm really excited to get to learn with all of you today. We are going to get to be exploring tide pool habitats and we have a very special guest coming at the end of this program. So make sure to stick around. Um, now, if you do have any questions at all, we have a live chat. You can text in your numbers. We'll get that up here right now. That number is 562 eight six one eight three eight so go ahead and text us or if you're watching this um, at another time you can also email us questions at live at lbaop.org um, so again welcome we're really excited to get to chat with all of you today now we're going to go ahead and put a tide pool habitat up here and i wonder if you've ever been to a tide pool before um, now here's a picture of a tide pool. I want to see what are the things that you notice. If you have any observations about this habitat, uh, go ahead and text live uh, your questions into this number right here. Go ahead and text us right here. What do you notice? What are the things that you're seeing? Hmm. Now looking at this, I am seeing some rocks. I'm seeing some water. Here's the open ocean, but the tide pool is actually this habitat that we're seeing right here. So this is that tide pool. Now, while you're texting in your observations, we're going to go ahead and try to figure out what exactly it is that makes a tide pool a tide pool. Um, so first off, let's talk about tides. So we've all been to the beach before, and we've seen that if you stay there a really long time, the waves will come up closer to you, and the waves will go down further away from you. And that's because every single day, twice a day, we see this change in tides. So at some points of the day, the water comes up high. And at those points, we might see these rocks covered in water. If you're at the beach, maybe you notice that the waves are coming up closer to your beach chair, your beach towel. And then sometimes we see the tide get lower. That's called low tide. And that's when that water drops down further. Maybe you have to walk a little bit further to get out to those waves. And we see things like these tide pools forming. So these tide pools are underwater during high tide and then they're exposed during low tide. And there's different animals that live inside of these tide pools. Now I wanna take a second to think about why it might be challenging if you were an animal that was living Living in this habitat. What are some of the challenges that you might experience? This is a really extreme habitat. It's really difficult to live in and animals that live in this habitat have to develop special adaptations. We'll talk about that word in just a second, but I want to try to figure out what is it that makes this habitat challenging to live in? Hmm. Again, if you have any ideas, go ahead and text your questions or your observations to this number here. That number is 562-286-1838, 562-286-1838. So looking at this habitat, we can think of what might make it challenging. And what do you see out here? Out here is open ocean right and so we can assume if you look really closely right here we've got a little wave so we can assume that the tide pools are going to have a lot of wave action so there's gonna be lots of waves crashing and crashing and crashing into that tide pool so our animals that live in that tide pool are going to have to have a way to survive with those waves so some of them might be sticky some of them might hold on really well they've got a way of holding on and we'll look closer at some animals in a bit to figure out how they hold on with those waves. Now, what are some of the other challenges for living in a tide pool like this? Now, we talked about the fact that the water level goes up during high tide and it goes down during low tide. Imagine how challenging that would be if you're an animal that's used to living in the water, like one of these mussels uh, living on this rock here, they're underwater for part of the day and they're out of the water for the other part of the day. So they have to have some sort of way of making sure that they don't dry out. So we've got lots of waves, we've got underwater time, we've got out of water time. These are all those things that make it challenging to live inside of a tide pool. Now, let's go ahead and take a closer look at some of the animals that live in tide pools and the adaptations that they have that help them survive. Now, we heard that word again, adaptations. So an adaptation is anything that a plant or animal has that helps it survive in its habitat. And this habitat is a tide pool. 
So here, this is one of our tide pool exhibits here at the aquarium. And we've got several different animals here. One of them is a sea anemone. You can see we've got um, some sea stars here. And I did see a fish zoom by a second ago. We'll see if that fish comes back. I want to take a second. Looks like we have um, a question. Uh, Tilong is asking, can tide pool animals be dangerous? That's a really great question. Now, there can be tide pools all over the world. So there's lots of different types of animals living in these tide pools. Um, for the most part, they're not dangerous, but of course there are exceptions to that. One of the animals that lives in tide pools, we'll see if we can get a picture of it, um, is a sea urchin. And sea urchins have these prickly spines. Those spines are an adaptation that they have that helps protect them. So you can imagine if you were a predator, you probably would not want to eat this because those spines are something that would, uh, that would deter a predator. So that's a really great example of an animal that could be dangerous if you stepped on it um, or something like that. So uh, they don't have these particular ones, these purple urchins that we have here in Southern California are not venomous, um, but they would hurt if you stepped on them because they're sharp. We'll go back to that tide pool um, video that we were just looking at. I want to take a second to focus on this animal here. I know it looks like a plant. This is actually an animal. This is an animal called a sea anemone. And we talked about how animals need a way of holding on. Now, sea anemones, if you look really closely, they have this sticky base right here. And that base is really, really good for suctioning onto rocks. So it, they're able to hold on to that rock, and that helps to make sure that they uh, stay sturdy with all that wave action that we see in the tide pools. Now, they also have these tentacles. I wonder what these tentacles could be useful for. If you have any ideas, go ahead and text us what you think those tentacles might be useful for. Now, I'll give you a hint. Sea anemones are really closely related to jellies. So what do sea jellies and jellyfish, what do they use their tentacles for? If you are thinking that they use them for stinging, you are absolutely correct. Sea anemones, like jellies, have stinging cells on their tentacles. So they use those tentacles to grab onto food. So if you were a fish and you swam into those tentacles, they might be able to sting you and help grab onto that fish and then pull that fish to its mouth, that circle in the middle. Um, so th that's another adaptation that these sea anemones have that help them to survive. And that's their ability um, to grab onto those animals that they feed on and pull them into their mouth. Um, let's take a look at another animal that lives in a tide pool. We can see there's lots of different sea stars and then we can actually see there's quite a few different species of sea stars living here. Now let's take a look at a sea star. Sea stars are really unique. Um, like other animals in the tide pool, they have, uh, most of them are, excuse me, sea stars like other animals living in tide pools are all invertebrates. So most animals that live in tide pools are invertebrates with the exception of that fish that we saw swimming by. Now, what is an invertebrate? An invertebrate, if everyone can reach around, touch your backbone, an invertebrate is an animal that does not have a backbone. So you have a backbone, other mammals have that backbone or that spine. Uh, things like birds and reptiles, they all have a spine um, or a backbone. But animals like sea anemones, animals like sea stars, animals like snails, those are all examples of invertebrates or animals that do not have a backbone. Um, so they use some of these other adaptations to help them to survive. Um, now, oh, we've got some really great questions here from Mrs. C's first grade class. One of them is about sea anemones. They're wondering how are they an animal? They look like a plant. You are absolutely correct. They do look like a plant. They look like a beautiful flower, don't they? Um, but they are indeed an animal. So sea anemones are an animal. Um, they are related to jellies. So in the same way that jellies are an animal, they are an animal as well. And Xavier is asking, why are tide pools important? That's a really great question, Xavier. Tide pools are important because they are that um, natural habitat that kind of breaks up the open ocean from the beach area. So those areas that have these rocky shorelines will have tide pools right in that kind of in-between area. Perfect. Um, now, I 
did mention that we have a special guest here. Um, we are going to take a break. I promise we're going to talk about Sea Stars next, but we have a really special guest that's going to be joining us right now. And there's none. Um, and that special guest is Amanda, and Amanda has brought our friend Drake. So um, just like we're learning about adaptations for animals that live in the tide pool, Drake has some really unique adaptations as well. So I'm going to step aside so that Amanda can come on in here. All right. So like I said, this is Drake. So Drake lives in the desert, so he's a little bit different than animals that live in tide pools. Um, and where does Drake live? Drake is found in Australia, and Drake is a prehensile-tailed skink, is that correct? Oh, Drake is a bearded dragon, excuse me. So there's that beard that you can see. Oh, so Amanda says that he has a unique adaptation. He can make that beard look bigger and make it change colors. And what's the benefit of that? So that beard helps to uh, scare other animals that might be threatening him. So the desert's an extreme habitat, just like the tide pools are. These long, so he's a really fast moving animal because of those long legs. He can actually you run on his hind legs using his tail, which is really neat. That's one of those other adaptations like we're talking about. He can change color going from a lighter color to, to a more dark color. And that helps blend in with this habitat or sunscreen. So again, that extreme habitat, they're dealing with extreme sun. And so we can use that color change to help handle that extreme sun. He can also lift his body up off of the hot sand or dig under the hot sand, again, as a way of surviving. We can see those really long nails as well. And you can notice those spikes on the side of his body. And they can ex inflate their body like we talked about in that beard to help him look bigger. And then those spikes can help protect him. Kind of like that sea urchin that we were looking at a couple of minutes ago. Oh, yeah, exactly. uh, he would eat fruits, vegetables, and insects. Eats fruits, vegetables, and insects. And he gets all of his water through those food sources. And they can be up to about 20 or so years old, late teens, early 20s. And this is so awesome. His favorite, his favorite food are insects. Especially worms. And Drake is one of our program animals here at the aquarium. So um, Drake is, is uh, trained to be able to be brought out like this so that um, school groups or children or visitors at the aquarium or people at our online academy can get a chance to see an animal up close. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Amanda and Drake, for joining us. And if you have any further questions about Drake, you're welcome to uh, send those in back to that chat line. Um, and we will go ahead and get back to our tide pool habitats. That was really exciting getting to see that visitor. Um, so we got to learn a little bit about some of Drake's adaptations in, in order to live in a desert habitat. And now it's our opportunity to learn a little bit more about um, our animals that live in the tide pool. And we talked about learning about sea stars. Let's go back to those sea stars that we were talking about. Um, so sea stars have adaptations that help them survive um, in 
a tide pool habitat. Here you can see these different types of sea stars. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is their, their um, outer layer, they're actually pretty bumpy. I have a sea star model here. This is not a real sea star, but I'm going to go ahead and pull this up here on my document camera so we can see how bumpy that skin is. Again, this is not a real sea star. Um, but if we zoom in, you can see how their, um, their skin's kind of bumpy. So that helps to protect them from drying out. We talked about how their habitat can get so dry. It also helps them uh, to protect them. It's kind of a hard outer layer, almost like a shell because it is kind of rough. Now, if we flip it over, we'll notice that in the center is where its mouth is. Now, sea stars have this really weird way of eating. Um, now, sea stars, what they do is they love to eat things like mussels and clams that live in shells. So they use these tube feet, these little sticky feet that they have on their arms. They use these tube feet to grab onto their food item and they pry it open just a tiny bit because their food lives in shells. They open it up just a tiny bit and then they spit out their stomach. So that's what you're seeing right here. This is the sea star's stomach. They spit out their stomach and they digest all their food on the outside and then they slurp their stomach back into their body uh, after they've digested their food. Pretty cool. Now this is a really great view also of these tube feet. So tube feet, they kind of look like straws with suction cups at the end of them. And these tube feet are what they use to hold on. So remember we were learning about some of the challenges of living in a tide pool habitat. And one of those are the waves and animals need a way to hold on because they live in those waves. So the sea star uses these tube feet to help hold on. So it's able to grab on to those rocks to help protect it. Now let's see if we have any other animals that live in tide pools, um, any other animals that we can talk about. Uh, we talked about the sea urchin, we talked about the sea anemone, and um, we talked about sea stars. Let's take a look at, let's see, there was a fish that just swam by. We'll see if the fish, there he is. So there's also a fish that can live in these habitats. And something I notice about this fish is it has stripes that help it to blend in. It also spends a lot of its time kind of sitting on the rocks. So it doesn't spend as much time swimming through the water. It's really great at kind of sitting on the rocks. Now fish are going to live deeper in tide pools. So they're going to live in areas that might be a little bit more um, removed from the wave action. They also might be areas that are just a little bit uh, safer. They're not going to be drying out. Obviously a fish can't survive if it dries out. So um, so the fish is going to be hiding a little bit lower in the water. Um, but they are fish, like this one that you can see, that spend more of their time sitting on the bottom to avoid um, having issues with that wave action. Uh, now let's go ahead and talk about another animal that lives in the tide pool. Let's talk about an abalone. There are lots of different types of snails that can be found in tide pools. Abalone are one of those. Um, they can found, be found in kelp forests. They can also be found in rocky areas like tide pools. I'm going to actually bring you back over here to my document camera so we can see what an abalone is. Again, if you have any questions, go ahead and send those questions into this number right here, 562-286-1838. That's 562-286-1838. So this is an animal called an abalone. Um, like I said, they can be found in kelp forests or in rocky areas like tide pools. And an abalone is actually a type of snail. Um, now this is not a real, or this not, abalone is not alive. This is just the shell. Oh, okay. Um, we got a great question from Ethan. We'll get to that one in just a second. Um, you'll notice also that here, this is the inside of the shell. So an abalone, like I said, is a type of snail and it uses this shell to help protect it. So again, these animals living in the tide pools need a way of helping to protect themselves and um, 
And when the abalone is alive, like I said, this is just the shell. There's no live animal in here. They have a sticky foot. And that sticky foot, we'll see if we can bring up a picture of an abalone. That sticky foot helps them to hang on to the rock. So here we have some abalone. This is that sticky foot like we talked about. Just like when you see a snail in your garden and they've got that sticky foot that helps them to hang on to your concrete um, or your bricks or whatever it might be. Uh, this abalone is using that sticky foot to hold on to the rocks in the tide pool. Uh, you'll notice also that their shells look a lot like rocks. So that helps them to blend in or camouflage. Now, let's go ahead and bring back that picture of a sea anemone. We got a question from Ethan. He's wondering, how can a sea anemone be related to a jellyfish when a sea anemone uh, sits in one place and a jellyfish swims? That's a really great question. So there are some differences. They are not the same animal, um, but they are related. So let's think about the body shape of a sea anemone and the body shape of a jelly. So this sea anemone, it has... Um, this kind of like trunk area where all of its organs are. And then coming off of that, it has all of these uh, tentacles. And those tentacles have those stinging cells that we talked about that helps them to grab onto their food. Now imagine a jelly. If you were to see a jelly, a jelly has the bell. That's the part that moves. And it has hanging off of that bell, it has these stinging tentacles. So you can see how their body actually is pretty similar. If you just kind of flipped it over, there are definite similarities. Now, one of the things that makes them really different is that this the jelly doesn't have that sticky um, foot, that disc that holds on like the sea anemone has. I actually have a model of a sea anemone right here I'm going to grab so we can see them both at the same time. All right. So, oh, that's not going to work. All right. So the sea anemone uh, has that that sticky disc that helps to hold on to the rocks because the jellyfish moves It doesn't have that same sticky disc. So that's a really big difference between them um, But you can see that they do have really similar body parts They're just kind of arranged a little bit differently because they live different types of lives. That's a really great question though, Ethan um, now we are talking again about tide pools. Let's go back to that picture of a tide pool. And I'm wondering what are some of the threats to tide pools? What are some of the challenges that they face? Um, a big one is runoff. So we see tide pools found in areas right now. Here's another image of a tide pool. Lots of different tide pools here. Um, tide pools are found in areas in between where people live and the ocean. So anytime we see runoff, um, like pollution or oil or anything like that running off of our city streets, then that will often go through these tide pools and it can, it can damage those tide pools. So it can pollute them. It can make it really difficult for animals to live in those tide pools. Um, another issue that they face is climate change. You can imagine as our temperatures get warmer, um, these pools can also get warmer. So these pools are exposed throughout the day. So the temperatures inside these individual pools can get pretty high. And as our world gets a little bit warmer, those temperatures can get a little bit warmer too. And that can cause issues for the animals living there. Now, one of the coolest things about tide pools is that they are a habitat that you can visit. But we want to make sure that if we visit a tide pool, that we visit them in a way that's not going to harm that tide pool. So because they are an area that's really accessible, you can see them every time you go to the beach. It's really important important that we visit them in a respectful way. So some of the things that you can do to make sure you're not harming tide pools um, is watching where you walk. First off, you want to make sure you don't step on a sea urchin. We saw that sea urchin earlier and that would not feel good. But you also want to make sure you're not stepping on other animals. So watching where you're walking, making sure you're only stepping on rocks and not other, not other animals, that would be a, a good thing to do. Um, you also want to make sure that you're not touching anything or picking anything up. Um, those animals, we don't want to disturb them. You can imagine if there were tons of people walking through there and everyone was picking stuff up and moving stuff around, that can have a really negative impact on those animals. Um, and then as always, anything that you look at while you're at the beach, like rocks or shells or things that you find, you want to leave them there so that the animals can enjoy those later. So um, I think 
that um, kind of wraps us up. Did we have any last questions? If you have any last questions, make sure to text them in here. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, now, teachers, if you are watching today, if you could just text in the number of students that you have to this number right here, um, that helps us to keep track of how many students we're reaching. So we want to definitely make sure we have those numbers. So if you're viewing with a class, go ahead and text how many students are viewing to this number, 562-286. 1838. And if you have any other questions, you can email us at live at lbaop.org. And thank you so much. I enjoyed getting to learn about tide pools with all of you. And we hope to see you again soon. We'll be back at 10 o'clock to learn a little bit more if you'd like to join us later today. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.